Welcome to the second module of our corn breeding lesson. We now come to the topic of hybrid corn, which is often described as one of agriculture's greatest achievements. Most corn that is grown and marketed by farmers in the U.S. is hybrid corn. Let's briefly review how corn reproduces before we discuss hybrids. Of course, flowers are important when it comes to the reproduction of plants. Corn has separate male and female flowers that are on the same plant. The term for this type of arrangement is monoecious. The tassel is the male reproductive structure for corn. The male flowers within the tassel produce pollen, which contains the male gametes. The ear is the female reproductive structure for corn, and it's composed of many female flowers. It produces a silk for each one of its eggs, which are the female gametes. Before reproduction can occur, pollination has to happen. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the stamen, the male part, to the stigma, the female part. Pollination is followed by fertilization, where the sperm from the pollen meets the egg to form the embryo of the corn seed. For more details on these processes, please see our Biology of Corn lesson. There are two different types of pollination, cross-pollination and self-pollination. Cross-pollination is the transfer of pollen from one flower to the stigma of a different flower on another plant. Corn is a cross-pollinating species where wind disperses pollen from the tassel to the silk of a different plant. Self-pollination is when pollination occurs within the same plant. This occasionally happens in corn. While it is less common for corn to self-pollinate, this type of pollination is important in breeding, as you will see later in this module. Now we will discuss how the hybrid technique was developed. Open pollinated corn varieties were the predominant type grown in the U.S. until the mid-20th century. Let's review the concept of open pollinated varieties. These varieties were allowed to cross-pollinate more or less naturally, and farmers saved seed from the best plants for planting the following year. Breeding using this method led to a plateau in yields. Yields of open pollinated corn were in the 20 to 30 bushels per acre range for the beginning part of the 20th century. The next step in corn breeding beyond open pollinated varieties was revolutionary. The discovery of the process for creating corn hybrids. This provides the foundation for the modern corn we have today. There are a few important concepts that helped lead to this great breakthrough in corn breeding. One of them, a concept called heterosis, had been known about for a long time. When two parents with traits that are greatly different from one another are crossed, the progeny are often superior to the parents in size, yield, and robustness. The concept also held true with corn as scientists discovered in the 1870s. Another term for heterosis is hybrid vigor. By the way, the plant that is the pollen donor is designated as male, and the plant that has its egg pollinated and produces the seed is the female plant. Corn has both male and female parts, so whether a plant functions as the male or female is determined by the breeder. A second important concept we need to know is inbreeding. Inbreeding is crossing a plant with itself or with a closely related plant. Again, the concept was familiar to early plant breeders and usually thought of as detrimental. Remember that corn is naturally cross-pollinated by the wind, but breeders can control the pollination process so that corn plants inbreed. When corn is self-pollinated or inbred, 
it has significant consequences in the resulting offspring. If you repeatedly self-pollinate successive generations of corn, each successive generation will get weaker and weaker. After a certain point, there is no further decline because the offspring have become genetically identical and they will breed true, meaning that the breeding results are predictable. In corn, these genetically uniform plants are called inbreds. You're probably wondering why in the world anyone would want a weak plant. Let's see what happens when we combine the concepts of heterosis and inbreds. If you take two different corn lines that have been inbred and you cross them, there is an effect where heterosis is magnified. The offspring is called a hybrid, or more specifically, a single cross hybrid. Crossing two heavily inbred corn lines led to an extreme version of heterosis. In the early 1900s, when experiments on corn hybrids were performed, scientists found that offspring of inbreds yielded beyond anything that had been previously seen. Additionally, the hybrid offspring were much more uniform than open pollinated varieties. Here is an example of two inbreds to the left and the resulting offspring to the right. The hybrid is quite robust, while its parents are clearly not. There was one problem holding hybrids back, the fact that those weak inbreds didn't produce much seed. This made large-scale production of single-cross hybrids economically unfeasible. There was one more innovation that occurred before corn hybrids became widely grown, and that was double-cross hybrid corn. Producing double-cross hybrid corn requires an extra step. Inbreds are still created and crossed, but then two single-cross hybrids, which produce large amounts of seeds, are crossed with each other to make a double-cross hybrid. Double cross hybrids are less genetically uniform compared to single crosses, but their use allowed hybrid seed to be produced more economically, so farmers could grow double cross hybrids. Here is a visual example of the process used to develop a double cross hybrid. First, two inbreds are crossed to make a single cross hybrid. Two other inbreds are crossed to make a second single cross hybrid. Those two single cross hybrids are then crossed to make the double cross hybrid. While double cross hybridization was quite the innovation back then, this technique is generally not used in modern breeding. Most hybrids today are single cross hybrids. Please see part 3 of this lesson for more information on modern corn breeding methods. Now that scientists had resolved the production issues around producing hybrids on a larger scale, Breeders from universities and seed companies began to develop many hybrids. Instead of farmers saving seed from their open pollinated crops, they purchased hybrid seed every year from public universities and private seed companies. Today, nearly all of the hybrid seed corn is produced by private breeding companies. Incidentally, hybrids were initially resisted by some people, just like many new technologies are today and were considered unnatural in comparison to open pollinated varieties. However, the yields of hybrids were so incredible that resistance quickly turned to acceptance. In 1933, very few hybrids were grown. By 1942, less than 10 years later, 46% of U.S. corn was hybrid. It was up to 80% in 1950, and now almost all corn grown from 1960 until today is hybrid. <music> the 
The average person probably doesn't realize what a great achievement hybrid corn was in the history of our country. The hybridization of corn was a true game changer for farmers and the agricultural industry. In the next section, we will examine why. Once hybrids became more commonly used, yields in the United States increased dramatically. Before hybrids, the yields of open pollinated corn had been stagnating around 30 bushels per acre. How did hybrids affect yield over time? Yields start to go up immediately after hybrids were introduced. In just one decade, by the end of the 1940s, farmers were producing corn yields never seen before and yields just went up from there. Nowadays, new hybrids are constantly being developed and replacing older ones. Yield increases are continuing today with yields that are over five times what they were in the early 1900s. Other crops have not shown the same dramatic yield increases that corn has. Here are the yield increases over time for two other major crops, soybean and wheat. Now let's compare their yields to corn. All three crops have shown increased yields since 1900, but corn has definitely seen the largest increase. Much but not all of this increase in yield can be traced back to hybrid technology. It's easy to focus on the greater yields of corn, but as part of yield improvement, corn breeders also improve traits such as resistance to disease and insects, stock and root quality, and tolerance to drought. While the yield improvements in corn due to hybrids was amazing and unseen before in any other crop, Hybrids are not the only reason yields increased. There were other improvements in technology that were happening at the same time. The higher corn yields helped to drive a revolution in machinery and farming practices. However, breeding is responsible for over half of the yield improvement. Mechanization of agriculture was also one of the biggest contributors to increasing yields in corn and other crops. The uniformity of corn hybrids aided mechanization because having plants mature at the same time meant machines could be used for tasks such as harvest, which had been done by hand before. Other technology improvements included herbicides for weed control, fertilizer, increased planting density, earlier planting dates, and irrigation. We discussed some of these practices in our corn production lesson. We now know how corn hybrids were invented and why they became widespread. In the next part of our lesson, we will discuss the latest technologies in corn breeding. Thank you for completing part two. To continue the corn breeding lesson, please see part three.